Hello, my name is Weston Kanishi. I'm president of the Sake Brewers Association of North America. Uh, we're the trade association advocating, promoting uh, the growing sake brewing industry across the United States, uh, Canada, and Mexico. Uh, to learn more about us and our activities, please visit our website at www.sakeassociation.org. Uh, tonight, we're really excited to bring you the third and last in our three-part webinar series in partnership with the Embassy of Japan. Um, <clears throat> we're especially thrilled to hold this event as part of the uh, National Cherry Blossom Festival, which is the uh, nation's largest celebration of the friendship between uh, Japan and the United States. Our first webinar in this series was a really fascinating uh, uh, dialogue between six Japanese and American brewers. That was followed by our second webinar uh, on um, uh, sake regulations and the future of the industry in North America. Um, we're, both of those uh, sessions, if you missed them, are available on our website, so please check them out there. Uh, we're very excited tonight to bring uh, you the debut of our animated short video on the joy of sake making. And this will be followed by a, um, a panel discussion with three member brewers uh, moderated by sake expert and uh, the first uh, Miss Sake USA, Jessica Jolie. We're very excited about this conversation. Um, uh, before we get started, I'd just like to uh, thank the Embassy of Japan in the United States for its partnership in this very important project. I'd also like to thank the uh, Japan House of Los Angeles, the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C., and the National Cherry Blossom Festival for helping uh, us in promoting tonight's event. A few uh, housekeeping matters before we begin. First, uh, this session will be recorded and available on our website, so please check us out in the uh, coming days. Uh, we will also have a Q&A session, um, if, and I encourage all of our viewers to submit questions throughout the session. You can do so by hitting the Q&A button in the bottom right corner of your screen. Uh, and finally, we have a, a survey uh, at the end of the webinar session. Uh, please take a moment to, to fill that out. We'd love to get your feedback on tonight's event. So with that, I'd like to turn to our panelists uh, for a brief round of self-introductions. Why don't we start with you, Jessica? Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jessica Jolie, and I am the inaugural Miss Sake USA and marketing director at Sake Discoveries. Um, it's an honor to be here amongst everyone tonight and to be hosting um, everyone. So thank you. Thanks, uh, Andrew. <laughs> hey, everybody. My name is Andrew Santafonte. I am uh, owner and head brewer of North American Sake Brewery in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, Patrick? Hello, um, Patrick Shear. I'm the brewer here at Ben's American Sake in Asheville, North Carolina. Yuka? Hi, I'm Yuka. I'm the founder and a developer of My Class Sake Home Brewing Kit and joined the association early this year. So I'm still a newbie. Um, it's eight in the morning here right now because I'm in Japan. So I'm very happy to be here with y'all. Thank you. Great, thanks Yuka. Uh, and thanks everyone. Um, now, Jessica, do you want to say a few words before we uh, start the screening of our film? Absolutely. Um, again, thanks for having us here today and in celebration of the 2021 National Cherry Blossom Festival, commem commemorating the friendship between the people of Japan and the United States. Um, we look forward to safely enjo enjoying the beautiful weather and the cherry trees and of course the sake that binds us together. Um, if it weren't for this unique beverage, we wouldn't all be here today. And I can honestly say that even from my own personal experience about 10 years ago, I had an epiphany with sake. Um, the Sake Brewers Association is excited to release its original and first of its kind animated film, A Sake Brewer's Journey. I think we've been seeing some teasers on social media and we are finally excited to share it with all, all of you today. So let's take a look. The first time I really tried sake, I was in a tiny isekaya in Osaka. 
I had some cheap stuff before, but never thought about how it was made or what premium sake would be like. That first taste was a revelation. I thought, all of this from brewing rice? A swirl of sweet and savory, fruity and earthy filled my senses. It was like nothing I'd tried before. It was cold, smooth as glass on my tongue, and it was so easy to drink. I tried so many different styles of sake that evening. I was astounded at how many different breweries created entirely new flavors. The whole place was erupting in kanpai as this American guy was falling in love with sake. I began learning more about my newfound passion. The Japanese people have been brewing sake for well over a thousand years. There are four main ingredients in traditional sake. Rice, water, yeast, and koji mold, which helps start the fermentation process. Everything about its production is a craft, from harvesting and milling the rice, to growing koji and fermenting the brew. It's actually brewed more like beer than wine, though the alcohol content is similar to wine. The whole process is precise and elegant. It totally captivated me. After returning home, I wanted to keep exploring sake. I learned that there's a growing number of North American sake breweries. After spending a few years home brewing and building up my skills, I'm proud to be counted among them. Sake brewing is beautiful. It's another world here in your backyard. The final product comes down to skill and intuition mixed with artistry. A lot of late nights and a bit of magic. This is real craft alcohol. This is next level brewing fueled by passion and a dedication to the craft. And this is North American Sake's moment. Word is spreading. People are looking for something new, something bold, something exceptional, and something that goes with just about everything. I always tell people that sake is not just for sushi restaurants. It pairs perfectly with steak, pizza, burgers, seafood, and the options are limitless. Serve a chilled bottle with your next meal and taste the magic. You don't need fancy glasses or a specific atmosphere. It's for everyone. Begin your sake journey. Mine began in an izakaya joint in Osaka. Yours could begin tonight on your own back porch with a locally made craft sake. Kampai. Woo! Yay! Yeah! That was great. That was awesome! <laughs> Wow. Well, what a great way to tell a story. It really captures the essence of brewing sake in a nutshell. I mean, two minutes, they really put it together. Um, and I believe everyone starts somewhere in their sake journey. So I'm curious to see how we all dived into this world of sake, um, which brings me to Andrew. Um, the animated story shows us about how North American brewers are changing the sake industry. Um, how does this relate to you? Yeah, so I mean, I think that in general, like the sake journey uh, is unique kind of for everyone. But, um, you know, for me, I, I got the chance to, to go to Japan and, and have incredible sake for the first time. It kind of blew me away. I think like most uh, Americans, I've had a, a really limited experience and, you know, maybe had really cheap, really hot sake at, you know, a sushi place and I didn't think too much of it until I was in Japan and, and was presented with a wider range of styles and a wider range of, of variety and realized that like, wow, there's a lot more than I thought was going on with this with, with sake. And then I got to, you know, dive into it a little bit further. You know, I had done homebrew of beer as, as kind of a hobby and, you know, with this kind of new idea of what sake could be, I really started to think about how to, how to make it. And that's when I, you know, fell down the rabbit hole, you know, trying to learn about how, how it's really made. And so, you know, that first batch of koji I kind of made in my attic because it was warm. And then my Maromi was like in the basement because it was cold. <laughs> but like that, I remember it so vividly the first time I opened up my koji and, and the aroma just enveloped me and it was like nothing I had experienced before. And I knew like, like that was it for me. So yeah, I mean, it, I guess like was able to, to kind of connect some dots and, and that's how I kind of got into the world of, of sake. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, every one of us, if we have visited Japan, it's like this revelation, you know, you think you know sake and then you see the world of, of traditional history ultimately. And then it just really opens your eyes. So I can imagine that first batch that you made at home was like, it's your child, it's your firstborn, you know, you're so proud of it. 
So how does one who started brewing at home really take it to the next level and start, you know, going into commercial brewing? How did that happen? Yeah. So that was a, a huge leap of faith. Um, and it's not easy like that. And that's, you know, a big reason why I think the association is really important. Um, because when I was first actually thinking about this is like, well, this could be a career. This could be something I want to do with my life. Um, it, it was daunting. And there was just a lot of, of questions and kind of the questions made me want to dive deeper and try to learn and understand. And um, so I think it, it's not, it's not necessarily easy to do, um, but it's possible, you know, obviously uh, we've been open now for about two years. Um, and so it's been exciting to, to kind of dive in. And so I think that like, for me, like I said, I started with homebrew and then as I got more serious, I, I really dove into the research that I could. There aren't as, as many resources available to us here in the US. And then I was able to visit a lot of US-based sake breweries as well as uh, make that trip back to Japan or, or several trips back to Japan and, and kind of learn from the source. And so I think that, um, you know, if you have the drive, if you have the will, it's possible to do. Absolutely. I mean, so again, it takes time. It's a lot of, you know, knowledge too, and commitment, like you said. So um, how long has North American sake, how, how long have you been commercially brewing? Or when yeah, did so, you? Yeah, we've been open a little over two years now. So, mm -hmm. um, but you know, before that it was, you know, five, six years in the making. Mm -hmm. um, and really a lot of, of, you know, trying to figure out exactly what's going on. And I think that um, that's like one thing I would, I would uh, caution a lot of uh, US like home brewers on is that you, you kind of have to bend your brain in a new way. Um, and while it parallels a lot of really uh, fundamental things that are happening, it's a whole different experience. It's, it's very uh, labor intensive. It's like a marathon sometimes with um, how long it takes to brew and the, all of the steps and all the steps are connected in a really interesting and beautiful, beautiful way. Um, so it, I would say also like if it's something you, you're willing to try and you have experience in other things, it's really good, but you also have to give sake its space to be its own unique thing. Absolutely. And I think, again, it's to your point, you said it's a marathon, right? I think you know, everybody always wants to sprint to the end and then be like, I made sake, but there's really so much about the craft and the process that it takes to brew. And especially being overseas, you know, a, a traditional beverage that's made in Japan, they have all the equipment and the machinery. And here in US, I think we're also adapting, right? So, you know, I know for instance, uh, like Brooklyn Kura uses like a, a pizza shaker for their koji. So again, it's it's about finding what works best for you and yeah. um, the brewery. So- Definitely. We, I mean, we, we, <laughs> We've had to take equipment from other sources. We've built, you know, different things like our koji table and our koji boxes. I mean, you're always refining. And that's, that's like a big part of what, you know, we do here is we're really working on fundamentals or we're working on building on top of that um, so that we can make our brew better and better with each go at it. And that's what it is. It's like you're constantly tweaking and you're constantly improving. And there are things that, you know, are hard to kind of get a grasp of like scale moving from homebrew to commercial brewing. The scale is a tremendous leap, you know, you know, 15 pounds of rice is something you can manage on a homebrew level, you know, 200 pounds of rice is a whole different story and working that much Koji is it's, I call it the sake brewers workout. I mean, it's serious. It's a workout. It's for a sure. And you're in, workout. you know, you're in, in a hot room and it's, it's, but that's like the, the drive is when you are in it and you're attuning your skills to it. When you're in that Koji room and you're feeling, you know, the temperature and you're feeling the, um, the, the humidity and you're oh, smelling the Koji. It's all like so, I guess, visceral. It's all just, it's all part of the process. And that, that's it's, what I think is so beautiful. Yeah. It's what I call the labor of love, right? <laughs> all your blood, sweat and tears, all of that. So I mean, like, what was the initial response? I mean, you've been home brewing, now commercial brewing, it's been two years. What was the initial response from like the consumers? Yeah, it's been interesting. I think that like the initial response has been extremely positive um, from all sides. I, I kind of make a joke like at our tasting room, like, 
because I'll have marketing people come in and they're like, well, who's your, who's your target demographic? And I'm like, I have no clue because the people who come in here, it's, it's all types. Um, and I think what I love to see more than anything is just that revelation when, when they realize that there are styles and variation and you realize that um, you see the brewery and you can like walk back here and learn about Koji. It, it switches on a light where, where they realize it's a craft beverage and they realize how much effort and time goes into it um, and they can taste that result. Um, there's, there's absolutely nothing like it. So, you know, we've, we've been lucky that our reception has been good and it's been getting better. Um, we're surviving COVID and, and are uh, continuing to kind of build upon that. So it's been, it's been exciting. Yes, I mean, I think we're all ready to kind of normalize again and um, really see these tap rooms filled with a lot of guests. Um, but so, so what kind of styles are you producing? Do you have like a signature or a house style? Tell us a little bit about the sakes that you're producing. Yeah, so, so um, some of the sakes that I'm, I'm trying to make are trying to be, um, you know, categorically uh, distinct. Uh, and so when I say that, I mean, like, I want our Junmai to taste like a classic Junmai. I want our Daiginjo to have those fruity and aromatic notes to it. Um, I want our uh, Karakuchi Genshu, our extra dry, to be just like earthy, umami driven. Um, and really to have it so, like I said, people can, can do a flight. We do a lot of flights at, at our tasting room and they can say, okay, I actually think I like drier sakes oh, wait a minute, I think I'm more on the sweet, fruity side. And it helps people form a picture of kind of what they're into. Um, and so that's really what I've been working on. You know, like, I'm really proud of our Serenity now, which is um, our Junmai Daiginjo. Um, I thought it turned out great. It's what I'm sipping on right now. And I continue to just work on it. It's going to be an evolution. Like, every batch is different, and we're tweaking, and we're pushing forward um, to make our sake better and better every time so it's hard to say we have a style but we're working on it <laughs> I, I always say you know it's it's always hard when you ask well what's your favorite because it's like the question when you ask parents well who's your favorite child you can't really pick one so I totally get that um I do want to point out as you know a consumer um I think for your products the labels are super catchy um because they are you know I wish we could show them but please you know for the viewers definitely look at uh, North American Sake Brewery because the labels are so iconic in that um, each one is so um, unique and designed with the visual image of like a cartoon character. What was, do you have an inspiration behind that? And Yeah, um, I think it was um, kind of following trends we saw in the other, you know, craft alcohol space, you know, kind of fun and reverent labels that um, kind of have funky brand names like our Real Magic and our Big Baby, which is our Nigori or Cloudy Style Sake. Um, and I think it's part of our mission, you know, to have like to get people more comfortable with and, and sake a little bit more approachable. So it's like, here's a, a design that you think is eye catching and cool. Um, it, maybe it's a little bit more relaxed and doesn't seem as daunting. Um, so you'll pick it up. And that's kind of the, the thought behind it. But it's also to me like sake is about drinking and having fun. And so I hope that you see a bottle and it looks fun to you and you drink it and you have fun with your friends. And that's like the best compliment I could ever have. So totally, totally. I think for all of us who are here, we just want to get people to drink more sake, regardless of what situation and tying back the idea of that animation, you know, you could literally have sake in your backyard. So I think, you know, the, the times are evolving and it's going to be exciting for the next few years for all of us uh, who are home brewing or making a commercially brewed sake. So one last question, where can we purchase your product? Because definitely I, I need to get some of my hands on your sake. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously you got to come to our brewery and tasting room as well. So. <laughs> But um, you can buy uh, on our website, forme1.com slash buy. Uh, we ship to about 38 states right now, I believe. Um, so check out that and um, purchase some sake. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. Yep. Um, and now uh, we have Patrick here with us from Ben's American Sake. 
Um, I understand, Patrick, that you have a background in beer and wine, which is really cool because you have like the best of both worlds. How did you discover sake and get into the world of uh, sake brewing? Yeah, so <laughs> um, I discovered sake by applying for and getting a job at a sake brewery. Um, in, in North America, that's a pretty rare experience, but it just so happened that the um, college I went to was in wine country and that town had wineries and a, 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 a mid-size large um, production sake brewery. And so I, I graduated from college and like a lot of people kind of, I don't know, do I want to use my degree or do I want to do something totally different? <laughs> and um, well, totally different. So um, I, I got into home brewing in college, wanted to, I knew I wanted to be in craft beer. Um, but you know, there's a winery down the road. Uh, I can ride my bike there. I can work in the tasting room. And I started cleaning barrels and um, working on the, the packaging line. Spent a couple of years there, fell in love with kind of the seasonality of winemaking, which there's definitely parallels to traditional sake brewing and kind of like that romanticism of, you know, like the start of something you see it through and like having a vintage. But uh, I knew I wanted to get into beer and uh, Sake One is the brewery also in Forest Grove, Oregon. And they were hiring for a, a seller position. And um, I thought I could kind of build my resume. I, I knew nothing literally nothing about sake. I think the only experience I had was as a minor, my um, older sister, you know, had a, a, a sake bomb, like on her birthday, <laughs> 21st birthday, that my parents like kind of like egged her into taking. So knew nothing. And um, next thing you know, I'm working at a, a, a large production sake brewery. And it was a great experience. Um, kind of my moment that like fueled this passion was tasting the fresh press Nama um, off of the Yubuda press and like seeing like how aromatic it was and flavorful, clean, smooth, just again, kind of like the video says, like I'd literally had nothing like this before. Mm -hmm. um, and so it was very eye-opening. And kind of from that moment on, I really kind of, you know, I, I, I have a, an interest in kind of lifelong learning. Um, and so that experience is like, there is so much, to learn here so many skill sets you know growing koji washing rice and um just kind of fell in love with the the process of of brewing sake yeah absolutely i think again you know it's pretty rare for one to be like i had a calling it's more like we fell down the rabbit hole or had this what if or epiphany moment just like i did myself um but again so the idea of craft beer and wine i mean all these things are so unique. Um, I mean, how has it been advantageous to you as now a brewer at Ben's American Sake, um, you know, with all the experience? I mean, obviously you didn't expect to fall into this category, but now you have a wealth of knowledge. Yeah, yeah, I'm, re I'm really pr proud of my resume. Uh, wine, um, sake, beer, I, I suppose the next thing is maybe distilling. Uh, we'll, we'll see uh, where that goes. But yeah, I think from the wine point of view, it's kind of that concept of um, having, you know, like a house product and like there, there will probably be batch to batch um, variances and, you know, seasonal differences based on, in the case of sake, um, uh, rice. Um, sometimes water even changes depending on your source and like how do you kind of brew a consistent product and um, so in winemaking, it's a lot of, a lot of blending, you know, the, this tank tastes good and like the grapes from this section of the vineyard taste this way. So we'll kind of blend it. And for us, when we're coming up with our traditional line, there's a lot of tasting and kind of thought that goes into like, is this kind of consistent and are we marrying the flavors the way um, we want to. And from the, the beer point of view, um, it's kind of, I feel like I adopted this kind of like, um, process efficiency thing where it's like how can we knock out you know three or four batches of beer in a single day which as Andrew and, and you reference like that's the sprint like that's that's the sprint game <laughs> and in sake it's like well you know tweak one th thing by a couple degrees and then you kind of have to let it play out and um but still like with with the 
the, the beer background kind of process flow and improving on efficiency always, um, especially as, you know, somebody who's doing the bulk of sake brewing by themselves is a pretty important thing. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'm really yeah proud of my background. And I think kind of creativity is also something that came out of the craft beer world where, you know, I'm not, a, not afraid to kind of um, do unique blends and kind of uh, maybe change a uh, customer's point of view of what sake could be. Which is very interesting, again, because, you know, every kind of background, it, it adds to what kind of styles you want to make. And again, just to add to the point of labor intensive brewing, I mean, I think it's also important to say uh, cleanliness and keep, you know, sanitation, all those things are really important in brewing. Um, but you bring up a fun fact on a kind of creativity. Um, tell us a little bit about your brewery, Ben's American Sake, because I heard that it was quite the rager. I mean, obviously before COVID, but I'm like, sure. I should have definitely been there because I love a good sake party. Yeah, you, you definitely should have been and everybody should have been there. Um, yeah, we, we hosted the first American Craft Sake Festival um, mm -hmm. back in the days when you could just hang out with other people and you weren't really <laughs> worried about <laughs> about the things that we are right now. Um, yeah, that, that was in May of 2019. And yeah, the first um, ever American Craft Sake Fest focused on promoting and sharing American produced um, craft sake. Uh, Andrew was there. Uh, Byron from Proper uh, Sake was there. Brandon uh, from Bunkura. We had some other sake breweries send product. Uh, they couldn't attend. But uh, we are hoping to revive that festival after a, a year hiatus, um, maybe late summer, early fall um, of this year. So you'll certainly get an invite, um, as everybody here will. Um, yeah, the, the Ben's Tune-Up space is, is super unique. Um, the origin story is um, two, two friends, uh, they're women, um, they basically were like, what, what do you wanna do? And like, they wanted to like build a bar. And so they found this um, tune-up shop. So Ben's Tune-Up is where Ben's American Sake is. And uh, the roof had burned down and they basically had this like cool, authentic space that they could create um, kind of their, their, their vibe. And uh, they, they wanted to, to be a sake brewery. There's a ton of beer breweries in Asheville. So they wanted to stand out. And um, I'm the third sake brewery uh, brewer here at Ben's American Sake. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we're, we're, trying to innovate and come up with fruit infused products, basically kind of, as you mentioned, like we all want to get more people drinking sake. And when a customer comes in and they kind of, you know, shrug me off, like, no, nah, I don't, I don't like sake. And I, I'm very confident to be like, well, you've, you haven't had ours before. Like ours is a craft brewed sake. We serve it cold. We serve some of them carbonated. We serve some of them like infused with various fruits or spices. Like, I promise you, we have a wide portfolio of usually 15 different products. Like I can find something that you will like. <laughs> Amazing. Um, for sure. Like, again, I was looking on your website and obviously prior to COVID, I mean, you guys were having comedy night and DJ night and really um, making sake accessible. I think that's really the key here. Um, I, I know a lot of times in New York City restaurants too, a place like Tokyo Record Bar, we're trying to make it very accessible and really break down those barriers for especially for sake newbies. Um, so again, it, you don't really know who's going to walk in that door, but for sure with your product, you know, they're going to walk out being like, wow, I never had a sake like this. And, you know, maybe you're infusing different flavors and I'm doing something unique. Um, so what is it that you guys are doing? Because I understand it's not as traditional. So you guys are infusing some flavors. I even heard jalapeno and pineapple, some apple spice sakes. I mean, these are really, really fun. And I think I need one as a roadie, like a little, a little yeah. throw. Yeah, yeah, we, we all do. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so um, I would say there's like two or three core flavors um, infused products and everything we do is, um, we use, uh, not necessarily, we use fresh fruit. Um, there's, there's like no sugar added. So like everything that you're getting is, you know, like our pineapple flavor comes from pineapple juice. Our jalapeno flavor comes from us juicing jalapenos. Um, same with lemon and ginger, same with blueberry lime. Like we, we aren't adding any kind of um, natural or artificial flavors. So 
that itself is kind of a, a labor of love and kind of um, throws a wrench into the production thing because sometimes um, your your batch of ginger comes from Peru instead of somewhere else and it's like well this tastes dramatically different so how are we gonna kind of blend this out um, but yeah lemon ginger sake and pineapple jalapeno are kind of our two best sellers from like the core 12 percent higher ABV um, traditional lineup and then um, actually we released it for that American Craft Sake Fest. Our uh, Yutang is a session sake uh, spritzer uh, that uses yuzu, uh, mandarin and tangerine juice. And that's our best selling product by far. It's what I personally prefer to drink after shift again, cause the lower ABV, I'm kind of used to the brewer mentality of like, let's have a couple pints, you know, after getting off work, a shift, drink, um, a shift drink, but you know, if you're drinking Nama Genshu, like that's, that doesn't really play. Like you'll get yourself in some pretty big uh, trouble. trouble pretty quick. Exactly. No, that sounds amazing. A nice yuzu sake. Again, I think the idea that it is a low ABV also makes it accessible in that like, you know, if somebody's a craft beer background and they're coming in, you know, not everybody knows that, you know, sake can be anywhere from 14 to 19 percent right. alcohol. And so having that low ABV makes it super accessible. And again, yuzu is so refreshing. The spring and summer seasons are coming. People are going to be drinking outside. Yeah. It's, it's something that we all want to have and try. Yeah, um, yeah. That pr product was created with the hopes of seeing locals and even tourists kind of floating the the river with cans of our sake like in their hands because like nothing screamed summer in Asheville like Utang essentially. But you know, floating the river is a big a big thing here. I love that. I can totally see that happening. The warmer days are among us, so we're all in good hands. Um, do you have any like fun projects or new flavors that you are coming out with or infusions? You want to give us a little teaser? Sure. Yeah. Um, we actually just trialed it last weekend. Um, we, we released a, um, a, a hop sake, which, um, which I know uh, some of the other brewers are doing. Uh, we found a supplier of um, hop oil. So they, they kind of concentrated um, all the flavors, uh, essential oils that you want from your hops without the kind of plant matter. And um, we put that into a 7% um, kind of sake spritzer base. And um, the results uh, were really well. Like it's, it's uh, just a very interesting thing. Like it kind of tastes like sake and kind of like a rice cereal base, but it, it has all these notes of pineapple and tropical fruit. And um, so we'll, we'll see how that goes, but that, that might be our next kind of... Um, maybe push in the spritzer, sake spritzer line. Awesome, I love the the adding the hops. Again, it, it kind of fuses the two worlds, right? right. Your sake, um, awesome. And just one last, last question, where can we purchase your sake? Yeah, so uh, we actually have um, two online vendors. Um, basically, we, we try to kind of maximize the, the two different companies. Uh, one company ships to, you know, half the country and the other company ships to the other half. So be between the two of them, I think we're getting to about 45 states. Um, but I would recommend um, basically just going to our, our, our website, bensamericansake.com. And then there'll be a tab in the upper right-hand section, find our sake, and you can kind of, I have it broken down by um, the state you live in. So, you know, we can ship to Ohio and on one platform, but California in a different one. and. So it's a little bit of a mess as the whole kind of online alcohol sales thing is, but um, but yeah, go to our, our home website and you should be able to kind of find something uh, to awesome. purchase. I, I, I can honestly say again, with this pandemic the last year, a lot more people are drinking at home. And so we are seeing, you know, an increase in sales, you know, with, for sake and again, kind of online business. So I think this is a great way too to kind of spread the awareness of locally produced sake in North America all throughout the country. So again, I will be placing an order soon, so, um, but hopefully see you guys um, at the festival if it happens at yeah, the end of this year. Absolutely. Thank you, Patrick. Um, which brings me to Yuka. Um, Yuka um, has her own brand called uh, Micra in which um, there are home brewing kits. So I think it's it's really interesting to see, obviously, the two worlds collide, Andrew and Patrick, 
who you know started with some background of home brewing, um, who went into commercial brewing. But on the other hand, we have here Yuka, who's you know from a family who brews sake for many many generations and is now selling home brewing kits. Um, so. I mean, how was that? What got you into making the home brewing kits? Tell us a little bit about that experience. Hi. Okay. So before COVID-19, uh, I used to go to New York pretty often. And I have been actually interacting with the interesting people in Western community. Uh, I'm sure some of you have noticed that I also took part in the first webinar, Sake Dialogue, as Katsuyama. As I'm a daughter of Kuramoto and interns of overseas in Katsuyama Brewery as well. Uh, the inspiration of the development of my club comes from a small project that I started with the chef Tomita and his son Lei. The owner chef and sake is the of Kage, a high-end Michelin star sushi restaurant in New York East Village. Um, it was just so fun, but when we play, we play seriously. Um, the <laughs> chef who loves DIY one day said, I want to make sake here. I mean, like there at the place, which led us to make double good for us together. But he couldn't satisfy with that, and he said it's not exactly what he had imagined, and he said he wanted to make sake the authentic one. Um, I had a knowledge of sake making, but it took three months of research and study to bring on industrial scale production process down to humble level. Then I created a prototype and tested my friends in Western community. And there I witnessed the power of sake brewing to attract people as they were enjoying making sake involving family, friends, and online sake community. Um, first of all, the chef Tomita was not really a big sake lover, he was more of the shochu person. Mm -hmm. But once he made uh, start making sake, he was hooked. He was completely captivated by the baby Moami, which changed his face every day, the aroma, the taste, what appears on the bubbles on the surface. And then um, he started to actually searching for the information about sake and sake making. Not only that, um, since he was making sake in his restaurant, uh, not only himself, but also the staff of the restaurant gradually become fascinated and curious about the baby Malami, and soon everyone got involved in taking care of it. And seeing all of this, I was reminded of the power of sake to engage and fascinate people. Um, uh, it's a little abstract, but I think sake brewing is just like play musical instrument, which is fun in itself. So Kalamata may be a professional musician in a way, but instruments are not just for professionals. Um, music is not only fun to listen to, but it's also fun to play by yourself. And by playing yourself, you will have the deeper appreciation of the beauty of the professional music, how incredible it is. And I think in the same way, it will be more, uh, sake will be more interesting if you try to make it by yourself. Um, one of the most common comments that I received from my club user is that Toji, a brew master, is truly amazing. Because since home brewing is prohibited in Japan, uh, there are a certain number of people in Japan, Japan who think like this. If people start home brewing, the amount of sake they buy will drop. But if you ask me, no way. Because uh, in the first place, sake geeks who even bother to brew their own sake cannot satisfy their desire of sake with just that much. They want to drink a lot of different variety of sake. And as is the case with my club users, once they make their own sake, they become even more research driven and buy and, and drink more sake than before under the name of study and market research. Uh, there's some um, micro users in Asia who live, like to live stream the brewing process and they always pull out another bottle of sake from their fridge and drink it while bring their own. They're always drinking. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, I absolutely. I think, you know, it's, it's, that was a beautiful story. Um, and I love the idea of musicians because right there, I think there's also a lot of improvisation adding to the spirit and really fine tuning, um, you know, what you make and the craft. So again, like the beautiful story, it really, you know, made me want to brew sake right now. So again, for, for people who are newbies, if you're a sake enthusiast, the idea of micro makes it super, super accessible. Um, so if somebody buys your kit, you got anybody can make it, right? Do I have to have some experience or can I know nothing about sake and still make an amazing batch? Well, 
as long as the temperature and the sanitation are well controlled, and you have the if you have the proper ingredients, which provided by Micra, yes. Um, the Micra sake and kit comes with the pre-made ginjo koji and kake rice, uh, which with a choice of sake rice between Yamada Nishiki and Gohek Mangoku. And uh, all the rice and koji are pulsed down to 50 to 60%, uh, which is not something that you can prepare at home. In recent years, we've seen more people uh, making their own koji at home, and I think it's an awesome trend. But on the other hand, um, the ginjo koji, which is necessary to make the premium ginjo sake, is still difficult to make at home. Mm -hmm. So koji is the key to sake making, and by providing the high quality ginjo koji, uh, the quality of sake is uh, guaranteed to some extent. And also, since Michael is selling globally, um, I assume that users from all the world with different values will not exactly follow the instructions. So Michael is designed with the variety of fail sales built in, which ensure the little mistake won't lead to the critical failure, a design that won't allow the spoilage or malami to happen. Excellent. I mean, again, you're really providing the base, right? Like you said, the ginjo koji, of course, many people are making koji at home, but to make that is really difficult. So you're providing all the all the needs for everybody. So absolutely, I think even my mom or my grandma could make it at home, which is awesome. Um, so where, where um, I know you, you're selling this product online. Do you find that there's a certain region that more people are purchasing or it's just global? I mean, all over Europe, uh, you know, America, um, do you know, like, or, you know, there, there's a lot of people who are purchasing it. Do you find interesting feedback from them? And tell us a little bit about the people who are purchasing the home brewing kits. Okay. So um, the, for the country, it's not skewed to any countries quite globally. Now we're selling to 23 countries right now. And I, I developed this product with the hope that it will be one of many entry points for people to interest in sake or to help consumers to deepen their knowledge and love towards sake. And since all of my products include a technical support as the benefit of the membership, so I got a lot of opportunity to hear direct from my customers. And this is one of the most enjoyable part of my job. And broadly speaking, there are two types of customers. Uh, the first group is those who enjoy uh, making fermented food or cooking, as well as the home brewers of beer or other liquors. So got interested in my club from the aspect from fermentation and brewing. And the second type of consumers are sake enthusiasts. And as for the first group of people, um, they have never been in a habit of drinking sake before. So it is sake home brewing experience that actually got them interested in sake. Mm -hmm. And for the second group, the sake enthusiasts I mentioned earlier, we cannot underestimate their desire and, and appetite for sake. <laughs> exactly. And I totally agree with you that even if you're brewing at home, they really can't keep up the demand because they obviously need to have a little bit more to drink. So yes, they're going to continue to buy sake. So there's no shortage there. Exactly. Um, so what, tell us a little bit about the style. So um, what styles of sake are you trying to feature with your kids? Um, right now, my club has the three types, uh, Kliss, Mellow, and Nana. And Kliss and Mellow are called Kotohajime series, and uh, Kotohajime means uh, getting started or uh, beginning in Japanese. And there are Jumai Ginjo and brew in three stages called Sandan Jukomi. It's the basic technique for sake brewing. And a crisp is a class Jumai Ginjo, and a mellow is a bit unique one, a semi sweet, plump, and full body, which uses more koji and a little less water. And Nana is the newest one, and it's my favorite because um, it uses two kinds of koji yellow koji and white koji. And by using white koji, which you often use for shochu making, uh, Nana realized that no lactic acid added molomi, as the white koji produces a citric acid. And nana means seven in Japanese, so it is made by nana danjikomi called seven stage preparation. And it makes the refreshing low alcohol jumai ginjo with a perfect balance of sweetness and acidity. The juicy is the perfect word for this one, and also the flavor that is calling it popular in Japan. And also it's suitable for arranging into sparkly nigori, and you can find out how on our website. Excellent, that's super exciting. 
Um, do you have just so one one more question for you? Do you have any plans to release some other fun styles that maybe you're in the works or you're thinking about releasing soon? Um, not soon, but it's it's still in just my imagination. But I like to collaborate with the American Class Dark Brew someday. At the moment, my Michael is using a koji made in Japan, but I think it would be wonderful to use the koji made by local builders in the States. And it would be fascinating if we can have something like a you know, sake brewing class. Mm -hmm. Excellent. No, I think, again, this is why we have this platform. I mean, you know, we, maybe down the road, we can see a collaboration between North American Sake Brewery or Ben's American Sake, which is why, you know, we're all here today to kind of tie the industry together. Um, but I do want to open up the floor because I am getting a lot of questions and I want to make sure that we get through this also to kind of create a little bit more of a discussion. Um, so here's uh, one question. Again, I want you guys to feel free to chime in. Um, I guess um, one is what is Koji and what role does it play in the quality of sake? And again, this can be answered by, by any of you guys, Andrew, Patrick, Yuka, and you know, Koji obviously is the, one of the key ingredients for sake and it is super unique. And um, if anybody wants to kind of maybe Andrew chime in on that. Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. Um, so Koji, Koji is a mold, um, and it's a really incredible mold that creates a lot of enzymes that turn starch into sugar. Um, and so without sugar, you don't have any alcohol fermentation. So you need sugar. And so, um, you know, you think about like grape wine, you press the grapes and sugar is there. You think about beer, um, and malt. Uh, is similar in that like malt has a little enzyme in it that helps um, them create um, sugars through a mashing process. But for sake, uh, we grow koji directly on rice uh, in order to create a lot of enzymes that then turn starch um, into sugar. And so it is a extremely important part of the process because without it, you wouldn't have any alcohol. Um, but it also contributes a lot of character to the sake as well. And, you know, depending on the strain of koji that you're using um, or uh, the milling of the rice that you're using, as well as the temperature ranges that you grow the koji in and the amount of time that you let the koji grow are all things that you can do to influence the final product um, and quality of product. And so... It, it really contributes a lot. And what I would say too, as well, is it's a very labor intensive part of the process. So um, it's around a two day process. And like I tell people all the time, like it's two days, I am here. I'm, I'm in my Koji room. I am uh, monitoring the temperatures. I'm breaking up the rice. I'm moving it from, from box and to different boxes um, to make sure that it's growing on just this right kind of curve. Um, and so, you know, like koji making is, is no joke um, at all. And it contributes so much. And so I think that like, the more people are learning about koji, I think it's great, you know, whether it's in, in more food applications like misos and soy sauce and um, crazy things like dry aging steak and all kinds of fun stuff. Koji is really beautiful to explore. Um, but it's something that I'm going to be learning about for the rest of my life. I, I know that for sure. Excellent. No, I and I think, you know, the the trends of sake being influenced also um, goes hand in hand with Japanese food culture, right? We're seeing a lot of uh, Japanese food experiences and other chefs outside of Japanese culinary world using Japanese ingredients, whether that's shio koji or uh, cooking with koji. Again, all these things do add to that. I will say, um, if anybody is interested in kind of diving deeper into the world of koji, there's a lot of books out there. Uh, actually, Rene Renzippi, the chef of Noma, uh, he came out with a, a book on fermentation. So again, highly recommend if you, koji in itself is its own category. So I think we can go on and on about that. But um, here's a fun one. And anybody who wants to take it on, maybe Patrick or Yuka, what's your favorite part about brewing sake or home brewing, I guess, in the sense for Yuka, be what's exciting about Micra? And then maybe for Patrick, what do you find a uh, pleasure or what's your favorite part about brewing? Um, uh, sorry. Go ahead. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, for 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 me, it's um, I think I mentioned this earlier, kind of like the um, the process of continually um, learning, and like we don't know what we don't know, and like every time we're brewing a batch, we're learning something different, and we're we're learning from that process, and kind of what Andrew was talking about with Koji, like I I very much view that as our as like the powerhouse of the brew. Like if uh, for a beer person, I would call the Koji room, the, the brew deck of uh, craft sake. Mm -hmm. Like you're, you're yeah, uh, creating enzymes, creating, creating uh, fermentables, but you're also controlling flavor profile. And so, you know, I had only ever worked with one um, strain of Koji and then I came to Ben's American Sake and within the first year, I think I'd worked with four different strains of Koji. Mm -hmm. uh, some weren't good, some weren't good. And then we like hit on one that worked for our system, our process, our flow. Um, and I just really love that kind of, um, yeah, hands-on learning. Uh, you're kind of, uh, at times you feel like a kid playing in a sandbox, but it's full of rice and Koji. <laughs> and you're at the end, you know, two months later or something like that, like you, have this delicious brew um, that you're you're full of pride and passion and can't wait to share it with your friends and customers and um, it's just a, a great experience. It's totally rewarding, right? You, you're putting the, again the labor of love into this craft, and sometimes you don't know what to expect. And I think too that really adds to the fun. Again, the idea of creativity for both of you guys and for Yuka, what's what's your favorite part about the home brewing kits? Um, since Michael is providing the koji already, so Michael is featuring more about molami nurturing stage. And I think it's the process that requires to sharpen our five senses, you know, the, the visual and sight and everything, and, and taste to the invisible working of the microbes and listen intently to this um, so-called cultural, scientific, and mysterious phenomena, aka fermentation. And so the Mola means nourishing process. Like one day you find it's kind of sweet and sour, but next day it's in totally change it to the ginjo sake. And every time you open up the fridge, you know, all the ginjo aromas comes up and it's kind of, I don't know how to explain this uh, beautiful experience, but I want everyone to try those, you know, every time you open up the fridge, you can smell it. it's an awesome experience. Absolutely. And again, you know, heightening the five senses, um, as somebody who's a brewer or somebody who is working with sake, I think it's constantly important for all of us to train our palate. You know, I, we can say that by obviously eating different kinds of cuisines, but also tasting a bunch of sakes. And I think that too in itself, aside from making sakes, to really just see what's out there, the different styles, uh, the different categories, what's happening in the U.S. So again, I think that's very exciting for all of us. You know, for me, I'm I'm not a brewer, but I, I enjoy drinking sake. Um, so that's that's again very fun for all of us, and hopefully, you know, we can drink together uh, at some point in time. Um, this one I'm gonna throw to Andrew um, because I I believe he talked a little bit about his experience um, in Japan. So, um, what did you find the most helpful, whether it was using resources from Japan or your personal experience? Uh, when you started your sake brewery? Yeah. Um, it's it's uh, being able to uh, go visit people, and, and it's a tough time right now for this, obviously, but um, and, and immerse yourself in, in it. Um, I was very fortunate to be able to um, learn from um, Diamond Shuzo out, outside of Osaka. Um, they welcomed me into their brewery and... Um, to be able to see the processes in person, which is really tough to do, um, it just, it, it, things start to click in, in different ways. And there's no kind of substitute for being able to kind of see it in person. Um, and I also visited a good number of sake breweries here in the US. So I would encourage you if you're starting to get into this to like plan a road trip and come visit us and go visit uh, Patrick and go visit some people because, um, you know, you can read in books, you can kind of conceptually understand some of these concepts, but sometimes seeing it in person 
will just totally flip the script and make you understand like, oh, I thought it was maybe this way, but in reality, it, it's because of this. Um, so, you know, if possible, obviously going to the source and, and coming to visit more sake breweries because, you know, there's, I guess there's book smarts and then there's just kind of the, just that the, the physical part of it that I think is really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. Again, you know, it, all of these um, experiences, I think, adds to kind of the uniqueness of what you guys do. And really, um, you know, it's important to really appreciate the craft. Uh, again, like you guys mentioned, it's so labor intensive and it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time and in, improving and really putting, um, you know, all the thought and care into it. Um, so the next one I want to throw over to Patrick, which I think I've actually gotten a few questions from the audience. Um, where do you get your koji spores? Is it from Japan? And then where do you get your yeast? Because I think a lot of people, you know, they you purchase them, but are you getting them from Japan or are these things sourced here in the U.S.? Sure. Um, so there, there's a couple answers to that question. Um, Andrew's answers might differ from mine. Um, we get our yeast from White Labs. Um, they, they were founded, I don't know, decades ago to kind of uh, fuel the craft beer industry. Uh, based out of San Diego, they have a location like two blocks from us in Nashville. So we are incredibly lucky that we have a yeast producer and they happen to bank uh, two different uh, varieties of sake yeast. So we, we use... Um, I think it's White Labs number 705 and 709. Um, 705 is our house strain. And I've, I've come to, uh, I've come to love it. Um, it's, it's, our, it's our house product. And it wasn't maybe what I, you know, thought I would be brewing, but I like the flavor profiles and the esters and the phenols that it, it kicked off. And I, I can work with that. I, I like it. Yeah. Um, for for Koji, it, that was a little bit more of a harder experience. Um, I you know I I wasn't the first brewer here, so I was kind of grandfathered into some things. And the Koji strain, I um, I later learned after contacting a a Japanese Koji spore producing company that um, we uh, uh, we had been using uh, spores uh, that were meant for miso making. Oh. <laughs> uh, which, yeah, you know, categorically, exactly. you, you just don't want to do, you know, no. it, it fermented, it was okay, <laughs> you know, things happened. Um, but that, that was kind of that big shift. Uh, I think that was during my first year where, you know, I, I had the packet of spores uh, from somebody. And, you know, I, I fermented, we, we just had to keep uh, production going. And then I dug into it and then found this other company from Japan that would ship to the U.S., and I ordered three different spores because I didn't know what to expect. I don't know. Um, and that the first spore that we used was actually now what is our house sake, our, our black label premium is made from the, uh, I might be pronouncing it incorrectly, but the, the Higuchi uh, Ginjo. And that, that is our house flavor now. And the, but yeah, I, it, the, the email interaction with uh, the owner of that company was he kind of, he didn't, I wouldn't say <laughs> laugh at me, but he's like, well, those, those spores you've been using are, are for me. So like, what are you doing? Exactly. Exactly. No, but see, again, those are the stories that we love to hear because again, nobody wants to say, Hey, I was using the wrong Koji, but again, it, it adds to building the characteristic and maybe who knows, you might come up with something that's interesting that actually works well. So um, for all of you guys who are watching, who want to brew sake, again, you know, Patrick just kind of gave us some quick tips. Um, and again, it is experimentational too, to that essence. You know, we, you don't just wake up and there's no written answer. There's a, there's a bunch of textbooks out there, but I think depending on the water, depending on the yeast, depending on the environment, all these things add to kind of the characterization of the styles of sake that you brew in which it makes it so unique. So again, um, I think, you know, right now in the U.S., there's about two dozen, right? There's about two dozen breweries, give or take, 
that are producing. So I think it'd be interesting, again, to just kind of see where we are a year from now, five years from now, how we're all exchanging information. And that's why it's so important to kind of all stick together and share that wealth of knowledge. Um, I have um, a question. This, this is kind of fun. I mean, Yuka, again, travels to New York quite often. Um, and there's a, a, somebody's asking, is there a sake brewery road trip map? So I'm assuming this would be geared for the U.S. You go, whenever you come to the U.S., do you have certain spots that you like to go for for sake or visiting producers or you just kind of go wherever? Oh, you're on mute. I usually like to visit all the restaurant the sake bars in, in Manhattan because, you know, the, the sake scene in Manhattan is so much different from Tokyo. Um, and then I want to get, uh, you know, receive a lot of inspiration from them. And also the competition in the big city is very harsh. So the their level and the knowledge that is very high about sake. And then I like really enjoying interacting with them. Yeah, awesome. I mean, again, I think for that, that question, there really isn't an exact answer because, again, there's constantly new breweries, there's new sake restaurants. What I will say is um, definitely stay in touch on social media. I think, again, you know, just staying in touch, um, even with the Sake Brewers Association, they can definitely highlight, you know, the key producers. Um, so for those of you who are asking for kind of a map, I don't think that exists in that well, sense. I was just going to say, just, I just posted a link. I know Bernie oh, did, did too, um, of, of the, all the, of all of our members in the association. So, oh, uh, it is a map and you can kind of make your own little, uh, road trip yeah. out of that. And there's some awesome breweries, um, that are part of that. So come Perfect. visit. <laughs> yeah, no, that means that somebody's going to have to do a little road trip a little road trip all throughout the US. Um, but again, yeah, definitely use those resources. Again, I think social media is a great platform as well um, as the link that they just sent. Um, okay, let's ask, well, again, I think this is such a kind of generic and basic question. Anybody who's willing to answer, maybe Andrew or Patrick, um, what's the difference between hot and cold sake? Are any of you guys brewing a uh, hot sake at all or serving hot sake <laughs> it's a good question we get it all the time um <laughs> and i think that like temperature is one of the things that's really fun with sake so it's like fun to explore um i think that you know most people have only had like really low quality hot sake um it's generalization so don't shoot me but like i think it's true i think it's true and i think that there. um <laughs> You know, like to, to explore some of the nuance of sake, especially in like the uh, Ginjo and Daiginjo range, like you don't necessarily uh, want to get those too hot. And so, um, you know, I, I just think that like for me, like sake, you brew sake cold. Like that's why there's a, a sake season where it was traditionally brewed in the winter. Um, sake is brewed very, very cold to kind of slow things down and to align the koji and the yeast and um, so for me, when I taste the sake every single day, it's cold. Um, and so to me, that's a very great way to represent it, to taste it. Um, and so I would say like uh, uh, in the winter, I think warm sake has a wonderful spot to just like warm up by the fire and have a really nice, you know, warm sake. Uh, but if you want to kind of explore nuance and depth and all kinds of things, I think slightly chilled is kind of the way to go. That's just my opinion, though. <laughs> totally um i mean again these are all uh, obviously our opinions and for me personally as you know the difference between hot and cold sake i mean i i truly like to drink based on my mood and sake is super versatile in that you know in new york here it's super cold during the winter months and obviously with covid all the restaurants were doing outdoor dining so we saw a lot of hot sake um, being very accessible for guests, whether it was the first time or they've had it before. 
and really saying like, you know, even premium sake can be served warm and this is great. And then now we're going into kind of the spring and summer months. So obviously sake, uh, cold sake, but again, it just depends on your mood and what you feel like. But I think definitely that's a constant question that we always get. Um, so um, maybe uh, Yuka, since you're doing a lot of the um, home brewing kits, why is um, rice milling so important to make sake? Um, so um, there's, for sake rice, then the outer, outer layer uh, contains more protein and fats, and then that can produce more off flavors. So the center press more uh, contains the more pure starch. And then in order to get the pure starch, we um, tend to uh, cut off the meal off, meal off the outer layer so that we can get the pure part. So ginjo sake, those uh, so-called premium lang sake, has a less off flavor and a more uh, fragrant aroma because of that. Got it. Yes, absolutely. And I, I always like to say, too, just thinking about rice milling, you know, when we eat brown rice, it's a little bit more hearty and textural versus if you eat something like, a, you know, Japanese rice in that sense, that tends to be like shinier, it tends to be a little bit sweeter and smoother. So just thinking about that logically helps me to kind of identify, obviously, more milling tends to be maybe a little bit more aromatic or smoother in that the less it's mill, the more the less it's milled, the more premium, but obviously the more that the core is, the outer layer is still around, you get more of a robust and heartier texture. Um, great. Um, and I think I just want to kind of wrap this up by saying, you know, what's one piece of advice that you would like to give to our viewers today, whether that's approaching sake or, you know, kind of the world of sake from each and every one of you guys. So I think, Andrew, if you want to go first, then Patrick and Yuka, just, you know, just keep trying. So something about sake that will excite all of us. Yeah. So I think this concept, I think, is just fantastic, which is um, that of jizake, which I think um, it kind of means local sake, right? It's, it's like your neighborhood sake brewery. So in Japan, there's obviously a lot more sake breweries um, and a lot of people have that kind of pride in their, their jizake, you know? And I think that we all kind of feel that in like the beer and wine world a little bit where you have maybe your local brewery or cidery and you're kind of proud of them because that's, that's like your hometown spot. And I think that concept is something we can equate to sake and kind of realize that um, the producers here in North America are um, working really hard to make as good of sake as they can and are putting a lot of time and love and effort and backbreaking work into it. And so like when you try a sake, it's, it's important to kind of remember there are people who are trying really hard. And that goes not just for North American brewers, but like Japanese producers as well. Like the amount of effort that goes into it and work is unparalleled. Like, I'm sorry, I know that like there are other producers who are making great stuff, but I think sake is the hardest drink to make and there's so much work that goes into it. Um, so it's like, I think kind of figuring out and learning about that appreciation of both the producer and that like you have something really local and special around you, you should, you should go check it out. Um, so that's what I would say is, is something to think about with every single sip somebody made that for you. Great, and for Patrick? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll maybe create some controversy and um, echo off of what, what Andrew said. Uh, I, I agree that, that sake is the most um, labor intensive product. Uh, having done wine, sake, and beer, beer is kind of a, a cakewalk, uh, to be honest, in a way. Like, I mean, I, I love it. I. I, I drink, you know, you know, IPAs and and light lager and you know all the things. That's that's kind of my go-to beer. But, but yeah, the um, the hands-on nature uh, of sake and like, you know, I I, I have um, assistants or interns like who have kind of come and gone. But it's like trying to explain. I you know I don't really have a good answer for you. I just I kind of I know it when I see it. You know, yeah. it's um, this very visual thing. And um, um, while I was at, at, at Saki One, there was um, three brewers who came from uh, Yoshinagawa uh, Brewery. And they were very much like, they were guys and they would look at our rice and be like, no, no, no. 
like <laughs> your rice is 34 percent moisture content mm -hmm. it should be 32 and like it was that moment where i was like this is this is insane like uh, like how how intense and like how you can um how invested you can get into this and like trying to like control your moisture content by a couple of percentage points and like that will then out like determine the outcome of your final product um but again like it at the same time it very much put a lit a fire uh under me to kind of like i i want to have those abilities and mm -hmm. to be able to control that and it's all all in the details down to the it to really the is point zero zero two you know again yeah, um, yeah it's yeah. it's very much detail oriented and lastly yuka um so well um there's no absolute standard for what is delicious and they change depending on the region and time period even within japan the people's taste vary from region to region and even more so in different countries and cultures and also speaking of the times, Ginjo sake has only become popular in the last few decades. So the criteria of the, the taste of Ginjo are also in recent de developments in the long history of sake. So um, what I want to say is that I think it would be great to see the sake brewers outside Japan and also home brewers not bounded by Japanese laws introduce a different value to and a taste to the world. And as the video video shows, um, the bitter sake resides not only in the finished product, but also in the process of making it. And then if you know the process and the story behind it, I think you will see and feel differently when you take a sip of sake next time. And uh, just for from Japanese perspective, because I'm the only Japanese uh, speaker here, so it'd be great to have the Japanese subtitle version of the video too, because there's still a lot of awareness about uh, Japanese American sake called sake in Japan, and I really want them to know more about it because it's super exciting. So I'm sure this great video will help us reach more people in Japan and learn more about American club sake. I couldn't agree with you more, Yuka. And again, this is, we're just taking baby steps. And again, like, thank you guys so much for this. Um, just to kind of like wrap things up. Um, again, there's beauty in all things um, that we create, especially when we are passionate about a product that we love. Um, sake, of course, is a traditional beverage in Japan, but today we continue to see more producers in the U.S. discovering sake and finding their own interpretation of it. Whether you're making sake at home, like Yuka who has the home brewing kits or commercially, there is an art form to it and truly a craft that more and more people are interested in. I know that the next few years will be very exciting for the world of sake because we have people like Yuka selling micro sake kits to easily streamline the process of making sake for newbies, sake enthusiasts, and really for anyone. Along with breweries like North American Sake Brewery and Ben's American Sake, who continue to educate and create awareness on sake um, through their product and tap room. Let's continue to share these stories about sake and the world around it because together we can make a difference and let's let sake truly shine. So thank you guys. Thank you everybody. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it. Me, me too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all uh, for a really, really fascinating discussion. I think that, um, you know, you really, I think, showed the viewers what, you know, how, how dedicated you are to the craft. And it's really inspiring. And I, I, you know, Jessica referred to the blood, sweat, and tears, and you all related some, some aspect of that. And uh, I think it just, again, shows your dedication to, to sake, uh, which is at the heart of our um, of, of our association. So thank you all for a really, really fascinating discussion. Um, before we sign off, I just want to remind our viewers that we have a uh, survey uh, at the end of this session. So please take a moment to fill that out. Again, we'd love to hear your comments um, on how tonight's event was. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank our partners once again, the Embassy of Japan in the United States. Uh, thank you for being so dedicated and all the hard work that you put into this uh, project with us. We're so proud to work with you. Uh, and we're also thankful to the um, Japan House LA and the Japan America Society of Washington, D.C., and the National Cherry Blossom Festival for their cooperation and support in this project. So with that, I'd like to thank all of our panelists again, thank our, our viewers, 
uh, for joining us tonight. I uh, hope you enjoyed the session. Please uh, check our website for future events that we're holding. I wish you all a safe and um, fantastic cherry blossom season. Um, and with that, good night and kampai. Kampai.